Okay. Well, we have two lectures left, just two. There will be a lecture, uh, sorry, there will be a quiz tomorrow, morning, uh, tomorrow afternoon at 2 o'clock as usual. I have talked with both of the program directors for the two divisions, and yes, you will be issued quiz eight by somebody other than me in the immediate aftermath of, uh, of this class. So there will be eight total quizzes, and those will all count towards your grade equally uh, in, the, uh, in the, the battle plan. Okay, so today we're going to talk about imaging informatics. This is not a topic you frequently find mentioned in, in, in bioinformatics classes in general, but in fact, the way we deal with image data are fairly complex and really do require a little background. So my hope today is that by combining information about image analysis, like what we saw with ImageJ this morning, can be combined very meaningfully with uh, the, da the data analysis for flow cytometry. I am borrowing some slides here from uh, Mike McCauley over at Vanderbilt University. He helped me put together some of the first slides that I ever had in my class for imaging informatics. But I really need to make sure I credit Purdue University. Their cytometry library, uh, laboratories make a lot of slides available for people teaching this subject. So we're going to start with a brief overview. Um, measurement of light intensity uh, certainly plays a role in both microscopy and in flow cytometry. Uh, as a result, putting these two topics together actually has a fair bit of overlap. So we're going to start by examining some of the problems of processing imaging data. And from there, within that space, we're going to be thinking largely about microscopy and more concretely about uh, confocal microscopy. Uh, from there, we're going to move into flow cytometry. Uh, as we, we think of flow cytometry as a data type that we largely manually annotate using software, but using our own, you know, our own sense. Um, as we move to technologies like Cytoff, uh, our ability to analyze these data manually is coming to an end. So we need to really have some notion of what kind of informatic tools exist to uh, accelerate this analysis. All right, so uh, if you spent some time in um, cell biology classes, for example, back in your undergraduate years, you probably remember working with some light microscopes that we have uh, some sample that we're producing an image from. We have light that's reaching it either because we're you know, shining a bright light at it or we're doing like, light coming up through the stage, it passes through an objective, down through other optics, and eventually it gets to your eyepiece and that eyepiece conveys the image to your eye. That's fairly straightforward. But think about how much things change when the light we're, we are observing is being emitted by the sample. And instead of having our eyes for the detectors, we are uh, collecting these, these wavelengths by an altogether different strategy. So back in 1957, the first confocal fluorescence microscope was created. Um, we have a fair bit of this. If we, if we think about uh, our eye at the top of this, it might seem kind of jarring to have a laser at the top of the other one. But in fact, the laser must get to the sample in order for the sample to begin emitting uh, it's, it's fluorescence. So we have a laser that excites, it's focused on a particular um, depth and, and uh, location within this, within this sample. Dyes within this sample can then absorb those photons and emit a new photon that is then reflected out to something called this PMT. The PMT. So that, that's, uh, the PMT is a photomultiplier. The next slide is going to be all about those. But I want you to think about the fact that our, our laser, uh, that our light has to be of the right frequency and it has to be conducted to the right layer of the sample, and that we have detection not by eye but by the, these photon multipliers. So the uh, these allow us to have a uh, the ability to focus our uh, our measurement on very carefully defined depths within the sample. So um, when you look at the PDF online, uh, you'll know I changed the heading on this uh, because I thought that it was, it was good to emphasize uh, photo multiplier. The, the term appears right there at the, at the side, uh, right above that uh, beautiful diagram. But I want to point out that we've already seen something very much like photo multipliers. We've seen electron multipliers because when we measured the ions flowing through a mass spectrometer, those that were reaching the detector were kicking loose this cascade of electrons. In this case, we don't have an electron arriving, we have a photon arriving. 
That requires somewhat different uh, kinds of receptors, uh, but we see that this, the arrival of this photon triggers a flow of electrons that gets amplified into, until we have a signal that we can actually measure. So um, it's blind as to color, which is a little confusing because we may have different photon multipli uh, photomultipliers for each of the different colors that we're measuring in a particular uh, confocal mi uh, microscope. So you may have three different PMTs, each of which has been assigned to monitor for a particular frequency of light, those being the frequencies emitted by the fluorophores in the samples. Okay, uh, so as I said, the color that a PMT is going to see depends on the filter that's applied to its inlet. Now, if you pack enough of these, that, I know that this looks like a big barrel or something. You might think a photomultiplier is this big. They're not. In fact, we have, um, we have in our cell phones, of course, CCDs, charge-coupled devices that incorporate millions of these. So if you have a 10, mil, uh, if you have a 10 megapixel camera in your phone, you have 10 million of these all packed together. So you can make a photomultiplier very, very small and very, very sensitive as well. I think perhaps that I have, uh, I tend to talk about visible light uh, to the exclusion of everything else. But of course, we have uh, a better ability to, to probe biological phenomena, to recognize the specific locations of, of fluorescent dyes if we're working at shorter wavelengths and higher frequencies rather than longer wavelengths and higher, uh, sorry, and lower frequencies. So when, we, when we're dealing with visible light, th this light is already here. I mean, we're not really, we don't have much choice in what things are, uh, in what frequencies dominate what we see. But when we choose uh, fluorescent dyes, we're able to scoop in the direction of smaller wavelengths and thus higher frequencies, which give us a little bit better to probe these very small features. If you really want to push it all the way to the end, though, uh, you could be using a type of microscopy that doesn't rely on uh, anything close to visible light. So something like the uh, electron uh, microscopes don't make use of visible light at all. They're, they're using beams of electrons. So uh, the gamma rays, essentially. So it's, it's worth thinking about where these sit. And more generally, we should be talking about the spectrum anytime we're talking about fluorescence, because there's a relationship uh, in the light that is incident on a fluorophore and the light that is emitted from the fluorophore. We'll talk more about that in just a moment. So what is a chromophore? A chromophore is one of these components of molecules that absorb light. Um, we, we often think of these chromophores then in connection with fluorescence. Proteins are already inherently fluorescent, and this is one of these things that comes into play when we're trying to deal with imaging uh, of, of these molecules. So, uh, if you have a, a tryptophan residue, we have a large uh, bicyclic side chain associated with it that can already give off light. So when we create our fluorophores, we're generally looking for these large ring structures to serve as our compounds. We also tend to think of lasers as pretty large and cumbersome, but in fact, the most commonly sold lasers are like diode lasers. And you can see that in the context of a penny, think of it as a uh, uh, one-tenth grand piece, uh, that these things are actually quite small. So you don't need uh, something even the size of one of these little barrel laser pointers that we use in class. These lasers can be quite compact uh, by comparison. And lasers fix us to a particular set of wavelengths that we're, we're going to output. I don't know that anyone's ever made a, a, a tunable laser that you, where you could modify the, the frequency it outputs, maybe I'm wrong on that score. But when we see, when we see um, the use of, of fluorophores, you better be conscious about what light you're using to excite it. Okay, now I mentioned that we were going to be talking a little bit about frequency, and it's, it's really worth our doing so. So imagine that you have a light that's coming in, in this case, for, at 495 nanometers. When we give the, the, the number in nanometers, we're talking about a wavelength. So maybe this, maybe this is obvious to everyone, and maybe it's not, but if you have a longer wavelength, you have a, a, uh, a lower frequency. When you have a shorter wavelength, you have a higher frequency. So there's an inverse relationship between these two. 
So if you have a, a particular die, it might accept a wavelength of 495. That photon is of more energy than the photon that it emits at this higher wavelength, higher wavelength, lower frequency. So in comes our light, out comes our emitted light. This is the, the function of any fluorophore. And between them, we have this distance between the wavelengths of these two lights. It, effecti effectively, that's a measure of how much energy is left over in this exchange. You've, you've dumped a certain amount of energy in, now you've got energy released, there's some loss, as there is in any chemical interaction. So the Stokes shift here is 25 nanometers, reflecting the amount that's just left in the molecule. Okay, um, I guess the other piece to remember here is that there's, there's a, an electronic response uh, to this fluorophore accepting a, uh, a photon that we see in uh, an increase in the orbital that uh, in the orbital of the electron. So uh, when the electron comes back to its lower, uh, its original uh, location, that we have this loss of photon, this release of the, the emission of the photon. Okay. However, when we deal with uh, when we deal with confocal microscopy, we're very frequently measuring multiple wavelengths at the same time. This may be because you have, for example, a DNA dye and something to show you cell membranes or something. In a case like that, you need to be able to measure both at the same time. How you choose those dyes will have a lot to say about how clean your measurements can be in either of these. So if you have uh, many dyes, then you may have an overlap in the, uh, the uh, wavelengths that they accept and you may also have an overlap in the wavelengths they emit, uh, they emit at the end of the day. So here we're just looking at the, uh, the emissions of these, of these two dyes. So FITC and PE are two different, different fluorescent dyes that we can use. And we ask about how, what wavelengths they emit these, um, uh, the, these photons to be. And we see that in this case, a very high photon coming from uh, this one may overlap with with that from the other. So frequently we will see a kind of uh, a filter that emits a whole range of frequencies being used in conjunction with these detectors. So this is called a band pass. You may have heard of uh, filters that, uh, that remove any frequency below a certain number or any frequency above a certain number. But a band pass is a combination of both. It will only accept things that are greater than a minimum and less than a maximum. So when we, when we figure out where these filters should lie, it's got to be in relationship to all of the uh, dyes that we're using in a particular sample. At base, whenever we're looking at an image, contrast is the, the most valuable feature that we have. If you have uh, so much signal there that your detectors are pegged peg out and, and way up at their high ends, you may miss seeing a contrast between light and dark areas of the image that you would otherwise see. So being able to uh, have an appropriate range of contrast in our images increases our ability to yield information from them. When we talk about dynamic range in an image, we're talking about the level to which the most intense signal we see compares to the, the least intense signal that we see. And that, if, if this is uh, all very narrow, your ability to detect that information is going to require an awful lot of fiddling around with how you expand out that range between them. So optimizing that con contrast makes it a whole lot easier for you to interpret the data uh, in your figure. Now in this case, we are looking at uh, an image as captured. So we see that we have a few light areas here at these boundaries. And we have a fair number of dark areas as well. That's, that's all fine and good. But it might be that we can improve this range. So in this case, we're looking at the left at this histogram reflecting the set of intensities across this entire image. So it, it also reflects the fact that we've got a few very bright points and a few very dark points, but most of it is kind of sitting in this great muddle in the middle. So in this case, we are using a linear representation of the the intensity values of this diagram. And that's reflected by the fact that 
this line has a, a uniform slope, and it goes from the, z the zero is at the zero value, and the one is at the, the rightmost value. We can, however, make it easier to interpret this figure if we're able to alter the shape of that representation on screen. So let's look at what happens if we force all of the uh, all of these dark values up. So in fact, what we've done is to shift how the, 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 the intensity data we've collected are represented with the impact here that, more, that, that everything gets shifted in, in, on the net to, uh, to brighter and brighter colors. In this case, the, the image has actually gotten a little harder to interpret. So what happens if we uh, start making more of the, the cells? Uh, what, what happens if we scale black to be a, a more positive number now? So all of these, maybe before we would only have a vanishingly small number of pixels that were black. Now anything below this level is, is defined as black. Now we see that we're starting to stretch the range in this picture in the apparent pixels that we have. We see that an awful lot more is standing out in this light versus black um, uh, image. So if you, if you flip through these three, and you were trying to evaluate which one is easiest to interpret, I think, generally speaking, this third image gives us a, uh, a greater de degree of contrast in the, the various cellular structures that we want to characterize. So simply mucking about with brightness and contrast, as we saw this morning, can make some information in these images much more apparent than if you simply leave the, the, the bright black and white scales pe pegged to their default positions. So brightness and contrast certainly matter. That's where the information is stored by altering how these, how these uh, limits set versus your histogram of values. You're able to make information easier to draw from the spectrum. Uh, from the uh, image. Okay, now this next part I think can be a little confusing for people, but I, I'm, I'm hoping you're going to stick with me on this one. A kernel convolution is a process that we use an awful lot, actually. And you may not even know you're doing it. You may open a, a, an image in a photo editor and then say, I want to see this smoothed. So you apply the, the image manipulation filter to smooth, and you suddenly see that everything is just a little fuzzier. It's not, a, it's not as sharp and distinct as it was. So much of this is handled through something called a kernel convolution. So I will uh, use my little pointer here. Imagine that we have an input image, and we have an output image that is produced through the, the application of this kernel convolution filter. So we have two inputs, essentially. What kernel do you want to use, and what image do you want to use as an input? From those two, this combined output is produced. So each square in the output image is going to be the product of many from the original image. In this case, we have a 3 by 3 convolution filter. Everyone sees that three, three columns, three rows. These columns and rows define how we're going to weight the, image, the, uh, the pixels in the original image to output one pixel here. So in this case, we're going to multiply negative 1, this top left uh, value, times the top left image, that uh, top left value in the image there, negative 1 times 3. We're going to multiply negative 2 times the, the 2 right below it, negative 1 times the third one here. The middle column is all zeros, so I'm going to just ignore them. I hope you don't mind, rather than multiplying a bunch of values by 0. 1 gets multiplied by 1 here, 2 gets multiplied by 2, 1 gets multiplied by 1. We then add together all of those products and divide by the sum of the convolution filter. And out of that pops a negative 3. So in effect, we're combining the information of 9 points, in, or 9 pixels, in the original image to output 1 in the new one. So then we can scoot this convolution filter just 1 to the right, and then we can populate this value in the output image using the second, third, and fourth columns all in, the, all in the top three rows. Does everyone see that? So in effect, this convolution filter is used to output every, every dot in the output uh, image from it. Now you still have to deal with these outer rows, and I don't know the rules for how that would be done specifically, but 
the, the notion you should get here is that this convolution filter defines a rule by which we can incorporate the intensity data for those nine points to create one output point. Sometimes the effects these convolution filters have can be a little confusing, a little surprising. So let's, uh, we, we can look at a fairly simple one here. This is called a Gaussian kernel filter. Now, it might not seem clear why we would call this bunch of ones, twos, and fours Gaussian. So I want you to think about what this would look like as a 2D histogram. Right, so we have a high center point, meaning that we're placing the most weight on the center point of this kernel. We have values that are half as high sitting at uh, the orthogonal positions to that. And then at the corners, we have this much lower value, just 25% the weight of the center point. So in effect, what we have is this sort of Gaussian-shaped filter that is, being, uh, that is being used to weight how these input intensities will be exported into an output. Uh, an output. OK. So in this case, the, the, the full weight of the filter is 1 plus 2 plus 1 plus 2 plus 4 plus 2 plus 1 plus 2 plus 1. In this case, it's 16. So that, that gives us the way that we divide out the fact, the fact that we have applied this filter. So what would that accomplish? Does anyone have a guess on this, on this score? You might think of it as kind of a high-frequency filter. It's, gonna, it's going to screen out the, the big jaggies that we get in intensity from one pixel to the next. So when we look at this, we see that our Gaussian filter is going to screen out some of these, these uh, values that rise and fall in intensity from one pixel to the next. That stuff sort of gets screened away when we apply a Gaussian filter. So a very noisy area, like say this one, suddenly becomes relatively smooth between the two. So this is one kind of a smoothing filter. On the other hand, you may be trying to maximize the contrast in your image. We already talked, that, uh, talked about the fact that contrast is one of these, uh, uh, it, it's the carrier of information in these, in these images. So a Sobel filter is, I think the example we were looking at just a couple, uh, a couple ago, uh, is, going to is going to really intensify edges, particularly vertical, uh, uh, horizontal uh, lines in this. So here we see we have this nice dark image, a big contrast passing from west to east here. And after passing through the Sobel filter, we get this really bright line showing the, that feature. So if you wanted to uh, accentuate the other edge, you could just turn it 90 degrees and run it again and see uh, edges like, say, uh, this one lighting up. So in the first case, we looked at the Gaussian filter. You could use that to knock back noise. In this case, we can intensify edges within the, the, the image. Okay, so both of those are examples of, uh, of a kernel filter. A, car, uh, a kernel convolution is another term we'll sometimes see used for it. But it's a way that we are able to uh, combine information from multiple points into a new output value. There are lots of terms that I think everybody should know in coming away from uh, a, a lecture about in informatics for image analysis. And this slide sort of captures all of those to, uh, in a nutshell. So segmentation is one of these first concepts uh, that we really care about. So imagine that you're looking at a, uh, a blood smear and you're trying to count how many cells there are. For something like that, segmentation is quite valuable to you. You want to be able to uh, find the borders of all the round objects that you can see in a particular uh, field of view. So being, segmentation is this process of making the foreground objects bounce against this background. Registration is also a very important one, particularly when we talk about motion capture. So if you're, if you're looking at multiple time points and you want to recognize that in frame two, we have some of the same objects that we saw in frame one, just in slightly different positions, registration is your friend. Um, we also talked about Z-stacks this morning. In a Z-stack, you have multiple um, planes of depth for a photograph. So it's, uh, it's not just uh, a, bu a, a bunch of unconnected 2D images. They're 2D images representing different layers in a, in a volume. So for something like that, being able to register that an object seen on layer 2 continues on layer 3, and you can detect that these are part of the same object, of course matters very much. 
Motion analysis matters. So uh, we, we already talked about that as a, uh, something that's part of registration. Being able to recognize the motion of an object is actually quite challenging because its overall track may be one part, but if that object is tumbling in space, you may also see that its, its representation in each moment can change because something that's tumbling may turn side on to you or, be, uh, or show its best profile, etc. Ultimately, in biological imaging, being able to quantitate matters tremendously. Having the image is, is grand, but if you're not able to, set, to translate those values into numbers for a hematocrit, for example, uh, you know, how many of each type of cell was seen, um, that's not as valuable. Being able to say, uh, if you're studying cardiac, uh, uh, cardiac, uh, cardiac circulation, and you want to measure the speed with which blood vessels are, or sorry, blood cells are moving through the vessels, you want to be able to quantify motion. So being able to turn images into data is actually uh, quite an, uh, an area of active research along a lot of different lines. So to talk about these a little more concretely, segmentation, uh, in this case, we, we want to see, uh, oh gosh, it's really, really dark. Maybe that'll look a little different on your screen. Uh, well, in any case, we want to be able to recognize uh, the, the nuclei of, of, of mice that we've uh, managed to separate out here, uh, mouse cells. So being able to separate them from the background really benefits when we can maximize the contrast between the field, the, the background and, and the foreground. We mentioned the, the necessity of registration, particularly in the case of Z-Stacks. So, uh, here, here's an example of that. In this case, we have uh, a bunch of 2D slices and we want to figure out uh, how these objects uh, can be matched across different slices as we increase the depth at which we're doing our, our focus. So if you're going to do 3D reconstruction, you should have some means by which to connect the image that you see at this level with those of the next level down or the next level up. That is the process of registration. Now, there's a really good little YouTube video on this. It's, it's quite short, so I'm going to see if I can play that back for us. I think it's set to loop, in fact, so that's even better. All right, I can just punch in our YouTube video. Maybe this will load. That would be very exciting. Maybe this isn't going to be viable. That's okay. But the, the link is right there. You can watch it. It's a short, short little. Oh, there we go. Perfect. So in this case, we're not seeing what the actual is. Yes. Oh, I'll, I'll play the recycle. Sorry. There we go. Oh, it's not showing it there. That's that's sneaky. Uh, all right. Yeah, it's not even looping it properly. We'll just throw this over here. Okay, and I'll just play it just as it is. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's going to play it just the once then. Say it'll be. All right. So we are not looking at the video as it was captured. What we're looking at is a rendering of the paths that these individual cells are following over time. And you can see no. <laughs> And back to our slideshow at the end. I hope everyone recognizes that mountain. What? <laughs> Who didn't recognize that mountain? Who hasn't seen this one? Okay, well if you if you can't if you don't recognize this mountain, I would suggest you go to this end of the hallway and look out the uh, look out the window, because that is Simonsberg, directly east of us. Okay, so in this case, what we're looking at are bright pips to show us the current location <laughs> of these cells. And these lines are the inferred tracks over time that those cells have taken. So this motion analysis is very valuable to us if we want to be able to, for example, uh, evaluate the speed at which cells are migrating in this process. So these are cells emerging from the embryonic quail heart. Poor quail, huh? 
Quantifying, of course, matters rather tremendously. So in this case, we're doing in vivo imaging of prostate cancer. So uh, if I recall correctly, we're, we're trying to um, be able to estimate tumor volumes as a, uh, as a function of the fluorescence that we get back from, uh, from these. So obviously, if you've got a live animal, being able to, uh, you, you can't really carve into it to figure out how far this thing is spread. So by using live, live animal uh, imaging, we're able to, to get these estimates by another route. So that's, that's kind of lovely. All right, on we go. Now, ImageJ is the software that we worked with this morning. It's an extremely popular toolkit. It's free, obviously. The source code is all available for it as well. And because it's written in Java, you can run it more or less anywhere um, with the same uh, modules being available. Uh, it's highly extensible, so we end up having lots and lots of plugins that are now available for it, many of which were funded by NIH. Um, so if you want to know, for example, how long this worm is, one of the things that you might start by doing is to trace its outline. At that point, you can start to uh, evaluate the, the, the length of the thing by uncurling it. All right. So for what, what, what is it that we would, uh, no, we're obviously changing course here. We've been talking about microscopy, specifically confocal. Now we're moving into this fine world of flow cytometry. What is it that flow cytometry has on offer? The first thing that we can do is that it can enumerate particles that are in suspension. So we, we tend to think of uh, flow cytometry for cell counting. Uh, so being able to enumerate cells that are in this fluid suspension is useful. Being able to distinguish between cells that are alive and cells that, uh, that things that aren't cells at all, that just happen to emit light, uh, is, uh, is, a, is a valuable thing. And you can even discern live and dead cells by the, the tests that we use. It's quite fast as well. If you need to be able to evaluate a million different cells in a minute, you can do that with flow cytometry. We have a whole core facility devoted to it uh, on the first floor here. So being able to measure particle scatter as well as the innate fluorescence or secondary fluorescence gives you the ability to, to turn the flow cytometry to a wide variety of uses. Um, and one of the things that people forget about uh, flow cytometry is that you can also use it for flow sorting to be able to pull different subpopulations of cells into different, uh, different epidorphs for further study. So what is it that we can, uh, how is it that this would be possible? Uh, one of the things that we're, we're looking at is light scatter. So if you have uh, light that's hitting this stream of particles, you can evaluate uh, its, its scatter, and that's useful for um, separating out populations of various sorts. Uh, we can specifically detect the fluorescence of particular reporters in these samples. So very frequently you'll find that people have marked a, a cellular marker with a fluorescent dye, and then we can look for that fluorescent reporter as an as a indicator that this is the cell population that we actually care about. It is a hydrodynamically focused stream of particles. Now, having spent most of my time in proteomics, I, I would think that this is describing microfluidics. But in this case, we're trying to make a, a steady stream of droplets that are about a uniform size, ideally that are that have a, a concentration of cells in them, such that we get one cell in each droplet. So there's a, there's a, fair, a fairly complex bit of uh, plumbing that goes into this to allow for that. Finally, we have this particle separation. We want to be able to use electrostatics to differentiate one type of particle from another. Um, if you've got two cells in a droplet, you need to know that and not treat it as though it's one cell. If you have no cells in a droplet, well, then it's not going to have much to contribute to your cell counts. At the end of the day, being able to deal with data like these in a multivariate framework is a rather important thing. We don't have a lot of people teaching statistics for multivariate uh, analysis here, but there are people in our division who are quite good at that. Um, people like uh, Gerard Trump and uh, Ian van der are quite talented there. So how is it that you can tell that a cell is present in a droplet or that it's not present in a droplet? And for this, we thank a Mr. Coulter. So um, he realized that cells are relatively poor conductors. So if you send a voltage through blood, that's all fine and good. Plasma, et cetera, is a very nice conductor. 
But the more cells you have in it, the, the less easily voltage can pass through this. So because the cells are, are going to transmit current much less well than the, the fluid around them, we're able to use electrostatic electrostatics to deflect these things. Okay, so the more cells you have, the, the, uh, the more the conductance of blood is reduced. That's, that's the Coulter principle. So in this case, I haven't shown uh, anything here to, uh, to, to do flow sorting, to be able to deflect cells into various pools based on what they contain. But that is, that is also uh, feasible here. So think of this as just flow cytometry measurement, not, uh, not segmentation into different groups. We have our cell sample flowing in. The nozzle is doing a lot of work for us here to get droplets that contain cells out. We're going to excite the fluorophores in these cells and then measure them in a variety of ways. We have a forward scatter, which is to say light that's passing from the laser uh, uh, basically right through, except a not direct line, the, the obscuration bar blocks that. We also get side scatter, that's what that top one represents, and this side scatter to, uh, to forward scatter measurement gives us the ability to, to uh, evaluate various properties of it. For example, are the cells alive or dead, as I recall, that's one of the pieces we can get from that. But, imagine, of course, that we are still trying to measure particular fluorescent markers on these droplets, to give us information about which subcellular population this is. For that, we're going to need to have our friend, the photomultiplier, all over again. Those photomul photomultipliers are going to be tuned to receive only the, the emission frequencies of particular dyes that we've added to our samples. All right, now, in this case, we're looking at, the, uh, at a model in which we have four different dyes on these cells. So we see that we have a fairly wide emission spectrum for PE psi 5, relatively narrow one here for PETR. PE gives, it, gives us a nice tall signal here, and FITC is over here. So it is possible then to measure each of these so long as you have a PMT that's tuned to that particular emission wavelength. Now, there, there are some pithy people in science, and I'm always in favor of, uh, of celebrating them. So Howard Shapiro is one of the persons who spent a lot of time in this flow cytometry area. Uh, he, uh, he, his first law, I think, is appropriate to anyone who has to work with uh, microfluidics, which is to say that a 51 micrometer particle will always plug a 50 micron orifice. In, in mass spectrometry and in, in, in um, shotgun proteomics, we frequently work with 100 micron columns. So if you have anything come along that's bigger than that, you have a problem. Next up, what you see is what you get. The data that we produce from these uh, were, were relevant to that particular sample. In a lot of cases, rerunning that sample is not viable because you've consumed it all in the first go. So being able to make sense of whatever data you get means that you should probably spend a lot of attention on designing the experiment to capture what you want the first time. Third law, what's in the bottle isn't necessarily what's on the label. Well, that's an uncomfortable reality. We like to think that our, um, our chemical stores are well organized. I, I skipped over a few laws because not all of them were funny, but I thought this, the sixth law, there are some cell identification problems that even monoclonal antibodies can't solve. We like to think that the, uh, the ultimate in being able to pick out one particular uh, epitope is about having a monoclonal antibody. It only, uh, there's only one epitope that this, this thing can hit. And yet, we find that there are some cell identifications that are quite difficult to do that even our antibodies will get us to. And finally, and this, this one's been saved a lot of ways by a lot of people, the seventh law, no data analysis technique can make good data out of bad data. I know this is not quite right, but I'm thinking of each of you as a young bioinformaticist right now. Okay. At some point, every bio bioinformaticist, the person who knows how to deal with the data, that could be you, right? The person who knows how to deal, the, deal with the data is going to be handed a data set that isn't worthy of wiping your feet on. And you will be asked, how do I publish this? Having this, this seventh law at hand is very valuable to you.
It is always appropriate to remind people that you can't make a silk purse out of a sow's ear. And sometimes the data we've got that people have collected are not worthy of the attention that it would take to polish them enough to make them look like an appropriate figure for anything. So it is always okay to say, I'm sorry, your data don't contain information. It's a damning thing to say, but it's still true. All right, now I've talked about measurement of multiple, uh, multiple floor, uh, on multiple flora floors at the same time. And that raises kind of an ugly question of compensation. So in this case, we have FITSI over here at the, uh, at the short frequencies, PE, PETR, and PE sine phi. This is a diagram we were looking at not that long ago, in fact. But here, we're looking at these gray boxes that have been constructed for them. These gray boxes represent the, the band pass filters that are giving information to the detectors for each of these colors. As you can see, some of them are wide, some of them are narrow. But I want to pay attention to the fact that some FITC has an emission that slides up here to longer wavelengths. As a result, when we're figuring out how much yellow signal we've got, how much of the, FL, uh, of the PE signal we've got, we must be able to subtract away some amount of contribution from FITC. And when we look at PETR, we would almost double the amount of the, uh, of the 613 that we think is present if, if we uh, fail to subtract off the contribution that yellow is making to that distribution. So when we use multiple dyes together, we have to be wary, wary of the overlap in their emission spectra. Okay, so when we say, when we use the term compensation, we're referring to the removal of the slop over from neighboring channels. It's not called slop over, but you, you get the point. Okay, now it may be that you are trying to do self sorting by your fluorescence, uh, by, by your fluorescent tagging. If so, you're going to need a real time assay that decides whether this one uh, goes into waste. This one goes into, uh, into tube 1 or into tube 2 or tube 3 or whatever. So there's, there's this division in, in, that, that you should keep in your mind between whether you're doing a prospective or retrospective count on these cells. If you're trying to do the subdivision of these cells into different physical tubes, obviously you're going to have to set your rules for what goes into tube 1 and tube 2 and tube 3 before you do the experiment. If all you care about is getting counts of these, on the other hand, you can do retrospective analysis. Both of these make use of a technique that we call gating. Gating is our ability to, to set a rule about fluorescence in order to decide what goes where. So if you are doing uh, software or analysis gating, you're looking at the experiment retrospectively and asking which of these uh, counts fall into what categories. So why do we gate? So in, in this case, we have CD45 and, and SSC. We saw uh, SC, SSC a moment ago. That's side scatter. So we're looking at these, uh, these two properties of individual droplets. In a lot of cases, we just have random droplets that are somewhere out in the middle of nowhere. But frequently, we find concentrations of these that represent different cell populations. So in this cell population, uh, we are able to uh, in this case, look at just these two channels. You may have measured more than this, but just in this pairing, we get these, uh, these two channels, and we see that different cell populations fall in different domains by these two uh, channels that we're measuring. So gating is going to give us the ability to separate these for, uh, for the counts that we want to accrue from them, or to gate them so that they end up in different tubes when we run uh, a flow sorting experiment. So generally, when we talk about gating, we're, we're, we often have a, a pretty simple rule about this. In this case, we may be trying to separate these blues from these reds, from those reds to those greens. And in this case, we could do something called quadrant analysis. On the PE scale, we set our rule at about 10. If it's higher than 10, then it's in the positive PE area. If it's lower than 10, it's in the negative PE area. 
Similarly, we can set another boundary on um, Fitzy, where if it's less than 10, it's in the negative Fitzy. If it's in the positive side, it's in the positive Fitzy. So this set, by having a, a, an, a, a greater than or less than rule on each of these individual uh, fluorescent dyes, we are able to separate this, this 2D space into four areas. So we call this quadrant analysis because these two univariate rules are separating the space into fourths. Okay. You can also do some Boolean logic. Does anyone remember Boolean logic from when we talked about it a couple weeks ago? Uh, about two weeks ago we were looking at Boolean values. Remember they have a value of true or false. And then you can use rules like or, or and, or not to connect these together. So in this case, we've drawn something much more complex than a, a simple greater than, less than rule. I think we would all agree. We don't have a, a simple rule saying if you're over this, you're in the plus, and under this, you're in the minus. Instead, we've drawn an oval in the one case and a trapezoid in the other. So we are we're judging that something that is in uh, that is inside the oval only is called population R1. Anything that is present in the trapezoid only is R2. Anything that falls in between them, we screen out. And anything that's outside either uh, outside both of those gets called the, the not pile. So rules can be relatively complex and can be used in this kind of additive way to um, to help us screen out, for example, borderline cases where this, we really couldn't tell whether the cells fit in this population or that. It is possible to use a whole sequence of these gates, in fact, to, uh, to screen out, uh, to, to separate to you know, 10, 20 different types of cells. So if you wanted to get an example of that, you might take a look at this paper from 2011. Here we see that we're starting from all, all, all these uh, cells. From them, we can pull aside myeloids right here. And then within this black set, we may want to separate them further. So you know, I, I want you to note that here we're looking at side scatter on channel A and CD11B. In the second one, we've changed the dyes that we're using to visualize them. So one cell population that was passed from this first uh, round of gating is then subdivided on these two axes to help us pull aside the B cells and pull aside T cells. Once we have the T cells pulled out, the, the green box, we're able to pass those to yet another pair of dyes. We haven't used those yet, CD4 and CD8, and pull aside the CD4 positive and the CD8 positive cells. And you can even come back to the set and pull aside these black ones that we haven't differentiated here and compare them on the C kit and the SCA1 uh, dyes and give us the ability to spot these HSPCs. Let me see, those are... Hematopoietic stem cells, I can't remember. What, what's it? HSPC, do you remember Paul? I don't remember, right? It's been a year since I looked at this paper, I'm afraid. But you can see that being able to use sequential gating, plus the, the, the use of logic, lets us uh, to, uh, to dig into these cell populations and subdivide them to a much greater degree. I didn't fill my water glass today, and I'm, I'm really feeling it, sorry. Multicolor studies generate a lot of data. We do have flow cytometry equipment downstairs that can measure five colors and maybe even six colors. Does anyone know what those downstairs go up to? Sure. To what? To 12. Brilliant. 12 colors. That's a pretty nice uh, instrument for measuring lots and lots of markers on cell populations. However, I want you to consider that the more colors you have, the more cell populations you might possibly find. So. If we were to, to, to look at uh, this diagram, we kind of get this in, envisioning of how many different cell types you can get. Imagine that in a one color model, you can say that a cell is a, a negative or a positive. We're just using a simple linear rule on each. If you have just one marker, you can separate them into two populations. If you have two markers, you can subdivide them into four populations. If you have three markers, eight populations. So you can see that we're rising, by, rising with powers of two just using this less than, greater than rule. And much more complex rules are, are certainly possible. So if you have uh, 10 markers, she said 12, 12 markers, 
then 2 to the 12th is the possible number of cell populations you can pull apart. Of course, by the time you're using 12 markers, you're generally using them to confirm each other. Um, and new instruments make that even 12 markers look rather, rather paltry. Cytoff instruments are now available over at the University of Cape Town. I don't know if we're purchasing one at some point or not. But the Cytoff instruments use an entirely different principle. Instead of using fluorescence to measure them, they're using mass spectrometry. So you can label different, uh, you can label different markers by different heavy metals. So when you have a, a particular uh, cell that passes through the instrument, you're able to see the, uh, the intensities associated with all of these different markers. So for 30 different antibodies, you can, be, you can be evaluating these cell populations. Obviously, when you get to numbers like that, your ability to rapidly work through the data set and figure out what your cell counts are becomes quite messy. For that, having the ability to do automatic gating is, hugely, uh, is, is a huge benefit to you in trying to make sense of the data sets that have come out. Now it's also worth noticing that being able to do kinetic analysis is valuable. So in this case, we might be looking at uh, uh, a certain number of, of, of seconds post-stimulation of a particular body of cells. So in this case, we see without stimulation, we're just looking at controls. So there's no change in these concentrations uh, over time. But with, when we stimulate these cells, we see that the fluorescence on, on the particular channels can change rather dramatically. So giving us the ability to measure time courses is something that's also feasible within the context of flow cytometry. We spend a little bit of time thinking about flow, uh, file formats, and I just want to point out that in, this, uh, in the field of flow cytometry, the FCS uh, file type has become a rather popular one. Uh, it was first announced back in 1984, so as file formats go, that's pretty ancient. It's not quite as old as FASTA, but pretty close, I think. Uh, they were in version 2 by 1990, and by uh, in 1997, version 3 came about. They've now been thinking about questions like internationalization. What on earth is internationalization? Does that mean you convince a lab in China to use it? No. It means that by, uh, by improving the way that text strings are stored in these files, we can make it possible for people who use different alphabets than we do uh, to make use of them. To, to insist that all text fit into ASCII is a little problematic because people like using things like accents or, for example, the Cyrillic alphabet. So if you're doing something like that, having the support for internationalization is a very good thing. Likewise, version 3.1 allows us to write information about the compensation that should be applied in a data set. You may have an FCS file that represents just a, uh, a uh, compensation, compensation control to give you some notion of how much uh, signal overlap we get from one channel to another. Uh, let me see example. But of course, we all care about metadata. I think we all remember that from last Monday. Being able to record these metadata in the FCS files helps us to avoid making mistakes downstream that would, uh, where the file has become disconnected from the sample that produced it. OK, so uh, you can learn more about that from this 2010 article that talks about version 3.1. So we talked about an awful lot of concepts there, but I, I hope that uh, you see how the, uh, the data analysis from something like uh, confocal microscopy spills over to, to be applicable in the realm of flow cytometry as well. We talked about concepts like segmentation, being able to recognize foreground objects against the background. We talked about registration, being able to recognize that the same object is appearing in uh, consecutive slices in a Z-stack. We talked about compensation, the fact that one die kind of spills over to uh, contribute signal to the next. Gating, how we set up rules for inclusion or exclusion of, file, of, of, uh, of particles, uh, of cells, for example. And we talked about the FCS files. So that's an awful lot. Uh, we went through it relatively quickly today. If no one has any questions, we might all just go home early. Does anyone have an objection? No objections, but there is a question. No, there's not. There's not a question. So let's all go home. Have an excellent night. Tomorrow you'll get your final in-class uh, quiz, but there will be one more to follow after. So thanks a lot.